Well, when I was in high school, I had to read the play 12 Angry Men. Now, I don't remember a whole lot about it, but it was a play in which you had 12 men who were on a jury, and they had to listen to a court case and then had to go and deliberate. And basically, the story was about their deliber deliberation. And the reason why it was called 12 Angry Men, because there were 12 men on that jury and they were angry with each other. Because when they first came back, 11 of the men were all decided, oh, he's guilty. And one of them wasn't quite sure. And as they discussed it, the numbers shifted. And so it took a long time when most people just wanted to get in and get out. But this one guy took it serious, and, and they deliberated and, and talked about it. But uh, the thing about that story is it was a good introduction to how court and juries work. Uh, that they, they have to look at the evidence and see if it's good evidence and see if there is enough evidence to convict the person. Is it clear that this person is a thief or that is it clear that this person is a murderer or whatever crime that he has supposedly or she has supposedly committed? Well, in our passage today, Paul will speak of being sure of some people's faith in Jesus. He's thankful for things in their lives that demonstrate that they believe in Jesus. It is clear that they are Christians. There's evidence. And so today, today we will see some of these things that are, are, are true of believers in Jesus. And we'll draw a challenge from it for all of us. And so we begin today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. The letter starts with this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church at the, of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, in this greeting or this introduction to the letter, we learn that the letter was uh, written from Paul and Silvanus, also known as Silas, it's just a Greek name, Jewish name, but Silas, and Timothy to the Thessalonian believers. And this greeting follows just a common form, but it contains some significant words that express important ideas. And so let's just take a quick look at these. The letter is addressed to the church, or more literally, the assembly in Thessalonica. This word church or assembly can be used as a technical term for the church, but really it, it refers to any kind of assembly, any kind of gathering where people gather together for a purpose. However, here, Paul makes it clear that he is writing to those who have a relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he is speaking to the assembly of believers in Thessalonica. And you know what? That's what a local church is. It's followers of Jesus who gather together for worship, to worship God together, and for edification, to be built up in the faith and to grow together. And this greeting, it ends with a blessing or a prayer that they would receive grace and peace. Grace and peace are significant Christian ideas. First, grace. We are saved by grace, but we also continue to receive grace from God for our daily lives. God helps us and he shows us kindness, and he gives us his favor as his children. And then peace is one of those benefits of his grace. Uh, on one hand, in the midst of life's struggles and difficulties, he gives us peace. But even greater than that, as a believer in Jesus, we have been reconciled to God. So we are no longer enemies of God or opposed to God, but we now have peace with God. And now we live in this relationship with God. We live in this peace that we have with God. 
And so we have this greeting at the beginning of this letter. And you might wonder who those Thessalonian believers are. And what is their relationship with Paul and Silas and Timothy? And so let's go back to the book of Acts. Keep your finger here or keep it marked because we'll be back to 1 Thessalonians. But we're going to go back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. It's the fifth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So Acts chapter 17, and we're going to see how their relationship began. They had just been in Philippi, and in chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ap Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, or the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and did a great, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down, and have, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So we'll stop there. So after leaving Philippi, where they had both a good response to the gospel and some opposition, they come to Thessalonica. And as Paul's normal, uh, what Paul normally does, uh, Paul and Silas go to the synagogue and they start sharing the gospel. Uh, the synagogue where the Jews gathered together and they share the gospel. And they teach that Jesus is the Messiah and that he fulfills the Old Testament prophecies, that he is the Savior and they need to turn to him and, and, and believe in Jesus. Now, many people responded in faith, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, but then things get bad. Because the Jews who don't like, uh, who don't believe in Jesus are jealous. And they don't like Jesus, they don't like Paul, they don't like the church, they don't like people believing in Jesus. And they don't, um, they don't argue the merits of the gospel or explain how they think it's wrong. What do they do? They attack. But isn't that what often happens when someone can't win an argument? You just attack people. But this is what happens. So they go out and they gather up the troublemakers who are just hanging around. And they get them all riled up. And they go to Jason's house. He's one of the new believers. They go to Jason's house and they want to take Paul and Silas by force and drag them out to the crowd, to the mob, so they could take care of them. But Paul and Silas aren't there. And so they grab Jason instead. And they take him to the city officials. And when they drag Jason off to the city officials, they, they make accusations against them. It, really, it's against Paul and Silas, what they're doing. But Jason is guilty by association. Jason is guilty because he has welcomed them into town, into his home. And so they, they accuse that they have stirred up trouble all over the world. They say they have turned the world upside down, and now they're here. Now, in one sense, this could be true, because when people believe in Jesus, when people hear the gospel and believe, their lives are changed. And then that affects society as well. So really, this is a matter of perspective. Are they causing trouble or are they making things better? 
The second accusation is that they say that uh, they're accusing them of saying that there is another king. Now, this one could be considered treason against Caesar. So they're really bothered by this. You see, the Jews here are pulling out the big guns. Like, we know how to stop them. They're trying to stop the gospel and trying to stop Christianity from spreading. And then Jason is, is just as guilty as Paul and Silas because he welcomed them into his home. And so after being in Thessalonica for about three weeks, Paul and Silas are chased out of town. And Jason is fa forced to pay security, which is kind of like bail. You know when you pay bail, you're paying money and you're, as a guarantee that you're going to show up on your court date. Well, this is similar to that. They're, Jason's having to pay money to, to guarantee that there won't be any trouble from these Christians, that they won't cause problems in town. And he may also be guaranteeing that Paul won't return. And so, as you can see, there was a lot of opposition towards Christianity in the city of Thessalonica. It was a difficult place to be a Christian. And so what happened? I mean, after Paul and Silas left, did the people who heard the gospel really believe? Did, they, did the, the opposition continue? And did, did the people cave to the pressure and go back to their old way of life? Or did they continue to uh, continue on and hold firm to the faith? Uh, these are the same kind of questions that Paul and Silas had about the Thessalonians. And so Paul sent Timothy to see how they were doing. It appears that Timothy wasn't with Paul and Silas when they were in Thessalonica, and so the opponents don't know him. And so it'd be a lot easier for him to just slip into town, check on how they're doing, encourage them, and slip out without causing problems for them. And so it appears that Timothy wouldn't stir up trouble and cause any problems for the believers who are still there in town. But we find out in 1 Thessalonians that Timothy brings back a good report. He brings back good news about the Thessalonians and some concerns. And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians in response to Timothy's report. He writes it to encourage them. He writes to, to verify his uh, apostolic authority in order to confirm that what he taught them was true. And he writes them to give uh, some instructions about life, both now and in the future. But Paul starts this letter by telling them how thankful he is. Look at verse 2. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. And so Paul says that he prays for them regularly and he thanks God for them. Uh, we see an overflowing of gratefulness and concern here in this, in this sentence, because notice the words he uses. He always thanks God and he constantly prays for them. Now this doesn't mean that he literally never stops praying. He is 100% always time praying and, and thinking. But he, he's saying that, that I'm very consistent about this. I do this a lot. And this outpouring of thankfulness is a response to what he heard from Timothy. Now, again, remember, he hadn't seen the Thessalonians or the Thessalonian believers since he had been chased out of town. It's been a while, and he doesn't know how they're doing. He's deeply concerned for them. He may be wondering, was there only, I was there only a few weeks. Was it enough time for them to truly hear and understand and believe? Was what they heard enough to ground them in their faith? Did they truly believe and continue in the faith? Did persecution scare them away from the truth? But now he's heard good news. And he keeps thanking God. Now in the following verses, he continues to tell them about his prayers. And he will explain why he's so thankful. Basically, it's because these people from Thessalonians, 
for Thessalonica heard the gospel, who heard the gospel, truly believed in Jesus. And it has changed their lives. There is clear evidence of their faith. Look at verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul mentions three things about these believers in Thessalonica. Their work, their labor, and their steadfastness or endurance. These three things all flow out of their belief in Jesus. They come as a result of their belief in Jesus. And so since they believe in Jesus, they've been changed and their actions demonstrate that reality of their faith. And if we look closer at these three actions, you'll see that they are described as coming from essential Christian character. Because what do they come from? They come from faith and love and hope. So first he says, I remember your work of faith. This refers to work done in faith or by faith. When someone has faith in Jesus, it results in works of obedience and, and, and works of devotion and of service to God. True faith changes your life and it produces actions. This is what James clearly uh, argues in chapter 2 of his epistle when he says that faith without works is dead or useless. True faith results in works. And Paul makes that point in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which we read earlier this morning. He says that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But we were saved to do good works. See, true Christians believe in Jesus and live for him. Secondly, Paul says he remembers their labor of love. Now, this word labor is used of exhausting work. And here it's tied to love. And so it expresses the idea of wearing yourself out because of love. In other words, this is a self-sacrificing work done out of love. This could be love for God or love for others, one another, but really it's both. Because we know, as John tells us, if you love God, you will love one another as well. And so if we love, we give sacrificially of ourselves. And at times, we'll, we, we will even exhaust ourselves for the good of others. Now, when I was reading this, studying this, I couldn't help but think of this. Uh, a couple weeks ago, some of you know this and some of you don't, but a couple weeks ago, I took a week of vacation and went up to rebuild my sister's shower. Um, it had been leaking and the water was getting into the walls, and so it had to be rebuilt. She got some estimates and called me and said, I can't afford that. There's no way I can pay for that. And the thing is, if you know me, you know I can do that, <laughs> not pay. <laughs> I can fix it, all right? I know how to do those things. And so she asked me if I would do it. And did I want to work that hard? And I worked hard because I'm still tired. <laughs> uh, did I want to work that hard? No, not really. So why would I do it? Why would I take a week of vacation when I could be resting and go work really hard? It's because she's my little sister. It was a labor of love. And you want an even greater example? Jesus is God. Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself and became a man. But not only did he become a man, he humbled himself and became a servant. So Jesus, who could have demanded 
everyone pay him homage and everyone come and wait on him hand and foot. He said, I have not come to be served, but to serve. So Jesus, who is God, became a man, became a servant, and ultimately served by dying on the cross. That's sacrifice. That's more than exhausting work. He gave up his life in order to save us. He gave up his life for our good and for the glory of the Father. That is a labor of love. As Christians, we are to love and serve each other. We are to help and encourage each other. We are to build each other up. As followers of Jesus, love drives us to work hard for the good of others. And then thirdly, Paul remembers their steadfastness of hope. Now this speaks of enduring without giving up, persevering even when it's hard. The Thessalonian believers were, were being opposed and persecuted, but they held firm to the faith and they kept living for Jesus. So when, when, the thing is, is when things get hard, it's easy to get discouraged. Uh, it's easy to want to quit. It may be easier to run away or to hide or to jump ship than to stand in the fire. And keep going. But endurance, perseverance, is a Christian characteristic. It's a character trait of faith. But how are Christians able to persevere? Well, it's because of hope. Because we have hope. Because we know what the future ultimately holds. Because we believe in Jesus, we know that we are God's children. We know that God is with us. And we know that we have eternal life. This is our hope. And hope allows us to keep pressing on. Hope motivates us. So faith, love, and hope. You recognize those three, right? These are the same virtues that Paul highlights in 1 Corinthians 13. They are the fundamental characteristics of the Christian life, and they are traits that we expect to find in believers. This is why Paul was so excited here to hear, that, to hear these things about these Thessalonian believers. It's evidence of their faith in Jesus. Look at verse 4. He says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. So he's continuing to explain why they thank God in their prayers. And, and this is the most directly stated reason he gives. They thank God because they know that these Thessalonians are true believers in Jesus, that they are saved. And he expresses this by saying that he knows God has chosen them. Now, we just looked at Paul's teaching on the election last week. So, but let's read this verse again. I'll read it for you. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5 and verse 11. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so to say that these Thessalonians have been chosen is to say that they have been saved and that they have received, uh, been reconciled to God and they have eternal life. 
But he also affirms this by calling them brothers who are loved by God. He's saying, they're, they're, they're in the family of God. They're in God's family, along with Paul and Silas and Timothy. Because Christians, we're family. And so he calls them brothers. But Paul can't just make this confident statement without backing it up. And so the rest of this chapter, Paul gives us why they know that these Thessalonians are fellow Christians. And the first evidence is how God worked through the gospel in their lives. So verse 5 he says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So the Thessalonians heard the word of the gospel, but it wasn't just words. The Thessalonians, uh, it, it, when they heard this, it wasn't just a mere, a mere human message. It, it wasn't just an impressive philosophy. It, it wasn't just a, a skillfully crafted speech. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he didn't use impressive words in sharing the gospel, but he relied on God's power. Let me read, you for, uh, read it for you. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So you, you can see Paul's using some of the same words here. The gospel has to be told with words, but it wasn't just because of the words that it was received. The Holy Spirit worked powerfully through the gospel presentation, and he caused them to be fully convinced of the truth. And so because God worked through the gospel message and the people responded in faith, Paul is certain of their salvation. And he continues on there at the end of verse 5. He says, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. This is another evidence. The Thessalonian believers uh, not only heard the message of the gospel and believed, they also observed the lives of Paul and Silas. They saw what kind of men they were. They saw how they lived and, and and, and they knew their character and their faithfulness to God. And then they imitated them. They said, that's what a man of God looks like. That's what a godly person looks like. We need to live that way too. And so they imitated them. The interesting thing is Paul and Silas were only with them for a short time, a few weeks but it was long enough for the people to understand how a follower of Jesus lived. And the Thessalonians started living in the same way. But they didn't stop there. He says they also imitated Jesus. So they learned what Jesus is like, and they changed their ways, their ways in order to live like him. And this change was disruptive to their lives. And it, it, it wasn't, and it wasn't welcomed by some of the people around them. And when they started following Jesus, they were mistreated and they were rejected. And some people made life difficult for them simply because they were following Jesus. But they did it anyways. They kept following Jesus. And they did it with joy. The thing is, is, this is an unnatural. Joy is an unnatural response to hardship. But the Holy Spirit gave them joy as they committed themselves to Jesus. And so Paul knows that their faith is real because they, they're committed to Jesus and to live with joy in spite of the opposition that they're facing. And he continues in verse 7. It says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Now, this is an amazing statement. These people, they haven't been Christians for very long. 
but they are already an example to others, an example of a Christian. So they're not only imitating their teachers, and they're not only uh, uh, Paul and Silas, and, and they're not, and not only imitating Jesus, but they have become Christians who others can now look at as an example, who others can imitate. They've become examples of faith and following Jesus to other people. And now they are an example to us as well. You see, Scripture teaches us that as believers in Jesus, we are to grow in faith and then help others come to faith and grow in their faith. And so we learn from our teachers, and then we teach others. And we, as we live a faithful, obedient life and serve Christ, we become examples to other people. And this is how the faith is passed on from person to person and from generation to generation. And verse 8. It says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. And so not only have they heard the gospel and believed, they are also spreading the gospel. They're telling everyone about Jesus. Paul says that the gospel has sounded forth. Uh, it, it, it's rung out like a, like a horn or like a cymbal. It's, it's, a, it's like a loud and clear sound that is heard all over. And so they talk about Jesus here and there. I'm going to sound like Dr. Seuss. Here and there and everywhere. Wherever they go, they're, they're just talking about Jesus. And so the gospel is being shared all over. In fact, they're doing this so well that everyone knows about the Thessalonians' faith in God and about their changed lives. And Paul says that he doesn't need to say anything. The idea here is that if he were to go to a church in the area and start talking to them and telling them about the Thessalonians, they say, oh, we already know. We, 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 we've heard or we've seen it. We, we know. You see, their faith in Jesus is obvious and it's well known. The way they freely share the truth about Jesus is evidence of their relationship with Jesus. And then verse 9 to 10, it says, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so this continues that idea of the, that the people already know about the Thessalonian believers. People have been telling Paul what they know about them or what they've heard about the Thessalonians. They've, they've talked to him and, and the, the news about the believers welcoming Paul and Silas into town and receiving the gospel. They've heard, they've told Paul about this, that they heard about it. And they also tell him about how they turned away from their idolatry to serve God. Do you get that? They, they rejected their lifeless, false gods and the sinful things of their past lives. And they have fully devoted themselves to God, to the one true God, the one who is actually alive, the living God. Of course, this means that their lives have completely changed. They, they will no longer fit perfectly into their society the way they did before. Because now, as Christians, they no longer take part in the sinful things that they used to. And because of this, many people oppose them. But they know the true God. They know the real God. And they have turned to him in faith and are committed to him and they now live for him. See, as Christians, 
we don't always fit in because our lives and our values are different. Because we're following Jesus. But we live by faith and we are committed to God and to live for Jesus. But Paul also says that the, the, these Thessalonians, these believers, are now waiting for Jesus to return. Now, who are they waiting for? He tells us. Jesus, the one who died for sins and was raised from the dead. The one through whom death and uh, through whose death, who, through his death and resurrection, believers are saved from God's wrath and judgment against sin. Jesus, who lives and is a, is Savior of all who believe in him. And he will return for his people, and then they will live with him forever in glory. You see, they know Jesus is coming back. And they're living in anticipation of his return. This means that their lives have been rearranged. Their view of life has changed. Their purpose in life has changed. Who they live to please in life has changed. What they are attached to in life has changed. Their, their focus and goals are different now. When they heard and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, the impact it made on their lives is impossible to miss. There's clear evidence of their faith. And their lives as Christians are now making an impact on others as well. Is that true of you? Is there clear evidence of your faith in Jesus in the way you live? Is your life as a follower of Jesus making an impact on others? I just want to encourage you this morning. Be a person about whom Paul would write, I thank God because it's obvious you believe in Jesus. I thank God because you are clearly imitating Jesus. I thank God because your life is making an impact on others. No matter how young or how old you are, or whether you've been a Christian for a short time or many years, just like the Thessalonian believers, you can be an example to others of faith and of following Jesus. So be an example.